All right, well, if you were here last week, which I think most of you were, we were looking at the major venues of activity in Europe in the 15th century. And last week we looked at Spain, we were noting how the Moors were being driven out of Spain by Isabella and Ferdinand. We looked at England and France and the Hundred Years' War, and we tried to highlight at that point briefly the career of Joan of Arc, a very brief career, I might say. She was executed at the age of 19. This morning we want to come to the third of these venues, which I'm taking together as Italy on the one hand, and then also connected to that, the Holy Roman Empire. But primarily Italy will be our concern. And of course the word that comes to mind when we think about 15th century Italy is Renaissance. And so I'm going to try to do the impossible and put in one brief discussion this morning, the Renaissance. So, you know, I, I'm prepared to despair right off the bat and just admit failure, but we'll take a run at it and see how far we can get through it. When you think of the Renaissance, a lot of names come to mind. I have three that I'm going to emphasize because they do, I think, pave the way for our consideration of the Reformation. One of them is the name Medici. You know the Medici family was the major banking family in Italy and especially in Florence at the time of the Renaissance. And very importantly for us, two of the popes who were very important at the time of the Reformation were Medici family members. And so when Martin Luther was dealing with Leo X, he was actually dealing with Giovanni de Medici. You see, that was the guy. And it explains something of the difficulties that arose and uh, surfaced during that time. Another name I've already mentioned, Savonarola. The third, of course, is Florence. All of the cities, the major city-states in Italy, were important in the Renaissance, but I don't think anyone would dispute that Florence is really the center, the heartbeat of what's going on during this time. So those are the three that I want to think about. Papal authority has been diminishing, especially her moral authority, not so much her political authority. She's gaining political power, the Crusades had something to do with that and so on, but the moral capital of the papacy has been seriously undermined by events of the recent couple of centuries. This was partly the result of the Babylonian captivity we've talked about before, the great papal schism. While the moral authority of the papacy is declining, you have another sort of rising force, cultural energy, if you will, that is beginning to increasingly exercise a kind of influence over the thought in Europe and especially in Italy. And I'm calling these by three words. These are somewhat arbitrary, but at least it'll give us something to talk about. The rising wealth, the rising humanism, and the rising sense of freedom that is just beginning to express itself now at the beginning part of what's called the Renaissance. The wealth we've talked about before was really the effect of the Crusades. The Crusades had started as probably a well-intentioned effort to rescue what amounted to the Christian presence, especially in Constantinople in the East, but it didn't take long for the Crusades to devolve into more of raiding parties driven largely by economic interest. People figured out that they could go East, grab a bunch of stuff, bring it back to the West, and sell it for huge profits. And inquiring business people began to figure out, you know, that that was a pretty lucrative way to make a living. And so you begin to see this rising wealth in the West that is dependent on secure trade back and forth by various means with the East. And so that's creating wealth. The wealth is especially being recognized or realized in Italy, but other parts as well, but especially in Italy, we begin to see that. There's also the rising influence of what's called humanism. This is, uh, of course, I think taken for granted with respect to the Renaissance, but something of the inner workings of this I think is worth at least a little bit of a further consideration. Uh, where did this humanism come from? In some ways, it was a reaction to the prevailing way of seeing ourselves, human beings seeing themselves, in the late Middle Ages. Now I'm describing here sort of people at the common level, not the upper echelons of society, the nobility, the clergy, and so on, 
but kind of that vast majority of people who were out there more or less working the fields. How important were they? And the answer is they were not very important at all, and they were made to feel that way. Humanity was small, you see. Human beings felt, for a variety of reasons, that they had very little significance in the greater scheme of things. There's a variety of reasons for this, and at this point I'm exercising a little bit of just kind of license with, you know, this could be approached many different ways, but I just want to float some trial balloons for you this morning as to some of the reasons that this was the case. For one thing, in Europe at this time, this is going to be the 12th, 13th centuries, late Middle Ages, you still have a fair amount of residual paganism in the culture. Even though you have an overlay of Christian understanding through the Catholic Church, even the Catholic Church at the time hadn't really sort of pushed aside a sort of pagan and superstitious view of nature. So it was quite common for people to see themselves as victims of all sorts of unseen, rather supernatural forces, uh, you know, goblins and various kinds of uh, invisible creatures that are hiding behind every bush and that sort of thing that makes people feel that they're not quite in control of their destiny, that they are always at the mercy of these kind of unseen forces that are manipulating their environment. And so humanity feels small, you see, in connection with that. You also have medieval scholasticism, which largely had embraced the Greek and especially Aristotelian view of things, which again saw people more or less as cogs on a wheel, a kind of mechanistic view of the universe in which people are not really able to rise above the machinery and become something over it, we're really part of it. And that was kind of the way, if people were born into their peasant status, there wasn't much they could do about it. They're simply a functionary in the greater kind of operation of this uh, human society. You also have the prevailing, or at least the, the not prevailing, but really the uh, ubiquitous sort of presence of Islam, which had a rather fatalistic view of the universe and was increasingly being felt in uh, Western Europe as a result of the influence of the Crusades. You also have the ongoing influence of Augustinian theology, which tended to place a heavy emphasis on things heavenly or things transcendent as if to say the most important things in the universe are not things in this world, nature, human experience, and so on. The most important things are upstairs in a kind of transcendent order. And if you look at the art that was more or less characteristic of this era, you see that kind of message contained in it. This would be a typical Byzantine uh, fresco, you see. And if you look at the images there, I don't know how well you can see them, you can see them kind of. Uh, they are not, you know, that's not the kind of picture you would get if you ran out on the streets of Spokane with your digital camera. You know. This isn't normal reality. The images here are otherworldly. They don't look like real human beings. They don't look like they're intended to depict real human experience. They are symbols, really, of something else, some other order. And in some ways, the art itself, reflecting that kind of Augustinian outlook, was saying that the most important things are out there. And we down here in our kind of perfunctory existence don't really have uh, a corner on the things that are really important. You look at this uh, particular image in which uh, at least the, the uh, purportedly what's happening is the angel is giving the annunciation to Mary that she's going to give birth to the Messiah. Well, how much do you think that actually resembles that incident in history, you know? I don't think the 16-year-old Jewish girl named Mary was sitting on this kind of throne. You know, I, I, this doesn't happen. And she doesn't look like a normal girl, does she? If you can see that face there, you really can't too well, I'm sorry. But you, you, it's, it's otherworldly. It's saying that these truths that are most important aren't connected to life here. This was the late medieval kind of view of things. You looked at the architecture and it would architecturally draw your eye upward. Those spires are saying to your eye, the most important things are upstairs. Look up into the sky. The people down on the ground there, you don't even notice them until I point them out, do you? Do you? you see, because they're, they're not really the center of attention. The center of attention is right up at the top of that, where every one of you was looking when I first showed you that picture. You go inside one of these, many of you have toured in Europe and you've been inside cathedrals like this. You walk in, how important do you feel? Vaulted ceilings, huge spaces, 
Those pews you can barely see at the bottom there are almost incidental. It's almost like you're walking into a space where something important is happening and you're not part of it. And that's part of the message of the architecture. This was simply the prevailing worldview of the time, that there is a sense in which there's an order of reality that is super important, but we in our mundane existence here are not really a very strategic aspect of that unfolding story of those things that are most important. Well, the, re the Renaissance changes that. And you begin to see a new interest in things human, and this is Renaissance humanism, where we begin to see some new appreciation of life here. And it takes a variety of forms. The first kind of literary figure who reflects this was Petrarch. He writes religious poetry, but it still contains within it a human element. There's play, a place for human emotion, for human experience. And this was a shift, you see, from the literature of an earlier era where human emotion was really of negligible importance. You look at the early Renaissance artist Giotto and his paintings, while they still are heavily religious in their content, begin to show a, a rather significant change from what had taken place in early artistic expression. So here we have the mourning of Christ, and if, I know you can't really see it, but if you took a close look, you'd see that the faces in this painting by Giotto now show emotion. There was no emotion in the Byzantine art. That's a human thing, you see. It's not important. But now we begin to see people showing grief showing human experience. Even more startling, we have Giotto putting a tree in the background. Where in the world did that come, you see? It's uh, in a rock. We have, we have human landscape, nature, beginning to uh, uh, show up. And, and this is part of what's happening in the Renaissance, is this new kind of appreciation for things human. Uh, there was a flood of Greek scholars that came into the West with the fall of Constantinople, which took place in 1453. You'll recall the Crusades was originally inspired by a desire to rescue Constantinople back in 1095. With some degree of success or failure, Constantinople was preserved until finally she fell to these Islamic pressures and forces in 1453, and many of the scholars of that day were Greek scholars. These were Greek-speaking people. They were from the East, and they were very conversant with the Greek texts of the New Testament and other Greek classic literature, and as they saw Constantinople falling, they just gathered everything they had, threw it into their suitcases, and headed west, hoping as refugees to escape the ravaging effects of the fall of Constantinople. And many of them showed up in Italy, probably most of them showed up in Italy with all of their bags filled with all of this Greek, you know, uh, literature and so on. And they just gave a whole new interest in the West to the original sources. Up until this point, the Bible was read in Latin. Now we're discovering it back in that original language of Greek and Hebrew, and there's a whole new interest in the biblical understanding of how we should see humanity. And the humanism of the Renaissance is not simply a recovery of Greek humanism. In some ways, if I can put this somewhat guardedly, it's a kind of biblical humanism. I use that term very guardedly. I know some of you think that's an oxymoron to say biblical humanism, but give me a little rope here, I'll see if I can hang myself. But anyway, it was something like that. I'm thinking, for example, of a guy named Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, who was a central character during the Renaissance. I remember writing a paper on this guy back in 1978. And at the time, I didn't get it, but now I do, you know, 40 years later. But, uh, but uh, Pico, wrote a very important work, and it was entitled An Oration on the Dignity of Man, you see. Many people who haven't read it assume that what Pico is arguing is the dignity of man based on Greco-Roman sources. It isn't. It was based on his reading of the Greek Testament, of the Hebrew of the Old Testament, of, of the biblical sources, and realizing really for the first time how important humanity is from a biblical point of view how the status of humanity had been greatly diminished in the cultural norms of the day, and it needed to be recovered in some way to more of a balanced perspective that really reflected a biblical outlook.
His argument was based largely on Genesis, where we're said to be created in the image of God, and also on the Incarnation, where Christ becomes man. That's a great affirmation of human importance right there, that God would become man. And beyond that, that Christ would surrender his life to redeem us. That said amazing things about the significance and importance of the human species. And all of this becomes part of the fuel that drives a character like Pico in his writing. The other thing that's happening at this time is what I'm calling the kind of rise of a sense of freedom. This is largely connected to what were called the late medieval free towns. The free towns were replacing the, the uh, feudal manor. You know, earlier, the economic center in the feudal system was the manor. And you had a noble person, a baron or a knight or somebody. You had all of the people that worked more or less at a slave status for him. Protection was offered in exchange for the product of the ground. In return, the knight would also offer his fealty or loyalty to upper uh, royalty, the king and emperor and so on. And it was kind of that sort of patchwork of connectedness in, in uh, Europe that was dominated uh, during that period of feudalism. The Crusades ends that. The Crusades is the greatest single force to undermine feudalism because this trade with the East opens a whole new possibility of revenue coming from some source besides simply the ground and agriculture. The trade, however, required a trading post, if you will. It required a place where trade could take place, and that usually took place at crossroads. So major crossroads in Europe became the place where people would set up shop and begin trading their wares with one another and with folks who happened to be traveling by. And obviously you can understand that towns began to grow in those crossroad areas. And so you begin to see the beginning of a kind of a new center of commerce. It's no longer the feudal manor, but now in competition with that, we have these towns. The towns, however, did not want to be under the thumb of the local baron. And so they would actually negotiate a kind of relationship with the local nobility in which they said, we will give you something of the product of our trade if you will insulate us from your kind of dominating authoritarian presence. Give us a little bit of freedom. And that gave rise to what were called the charters. Charters were contracts between these medieval towns, these newly formed towns, and the local baron, in which the baron would agree to protect a little bit of autonomy for these towns in exchange for a certain degree of revenue. And with that kind of freedom came an almost an explosion of a new way of ordering society. I don't think the barons even saw it coming, you know. The towns were therefore not under the authority of the baron. They came to be dominated more by what were called guilds, which were trade organizations in which people would control various kinds of commodities that were being traded within the towns. Well, the towns uh, gave rise to the need for financing, and so you begin to see banking interests occurring there in these towns. You know, bank is from the Latin or the uh, Italian word banco, which means uh, counter, and that's who these guys were originally. They just had a kind of counter out there in the open marketplace, and they would provide credit, and that gave the possibility of of uh, more activity economically, and so on. And so that was taking place. The medieval towns over time became centers of, I mean, people would escape to the towns to be free. So they were called free towns. If you made it to the town, in some ways it meant you escaped the status of being a serf and you engaged in the activity there. And the towns became quite the center of activity and you have all of these medieval images of the town fair and people out there in the streets, the jugglers and all this stuff that we think of. This was really the time when this was happening and it was really driven, you might say, by the economic transformation that had come originally out of the uh, Crusades. The free towns also, most importantly, gave rise to a new educational paradigm. Up until this point, if you wanted an education, you had to go to the monastery. And if you wanted a good education, you needed to become a monk and you needed to take holy orders, and you needed to devote yourself to the Pope and to the church, and you needed to become a person who was religious, and education was thoroughly dominated then by the authority of the church. The towns began to create an alternative educational option that was called the university.
And some of these early medieval universities were really the product of these free towns and the educational creation that came by virtue of their existence there. The difference between the education in the monastery and the, the education in the university is the university was not under the immediate authority of the church. And so there was a fair amount of freedom of thought. It was still at least ostensibly and facially devoted to the church, but you still had a whole lot more consideration of ideas that were not exactly in lockstep with church theology. So people like Abelard, people like William of Ockham, others who come along are able to do some of their thinking in a rather free environment, creating a, a somewhat different view of things than had been simply the product of uh, traditional scholastic Catholic thought. In addition to all of this, you have these characters that we've mentioned before, Peter Waldo, John Wycliffe, uh, John Huss, and the guy that I want to think about this morning, the, the fourth of these pre-Reformation reformers, is uh, Irolamo Savranola. But before we can get to him, I still have to give you a little bit more, and this has to do with the Medici. So we can't really get Savranola unless we know something about the Medici. So uh, who are the Medici? Well, the first of these guys was born into poverty. He was named Giovanni di Bici de Medici. He was born in Florence, 1360, so right in the middle of the 14th century. Good-looking guy. He was born during the time of the papal captivity. We've talked about the so-called Babylonian captivity of the papacy, and he was born right in the middle of that. So he's born at a time when the papal office has had a declining prestige. And that is the reality that he is familiar with as he begins to get going. He was in a poor family, but he himself was a genius, and he was especially uh, interested in money and financing, and beginning at very modest levels, he's just by dint of, of you know, singular genius and so on, was able to begin developing this kind of banking activity in one of these towns. Florence was sort of a typical uh, town that was beginning to uh, have some kind of uh, participation at the, same, at the same time that others were as well. So he takes an interest in banking. When the year 1410 comes around, it was a critical year. This was the great papal schism. You have one pope who's in Avignon, near France. You have one pope who's in Rome. The two popes hate each other. They've condemned each other. They've excommunicated each other. They've called each other the Antichrist and other things that don't indicate a whole lot of love between them. And people are being forced to choose who's the right pope. Now, later, the Roman Catholic Church told us who the right pope was, and we appreciate that, but at the time, it wasn't so clear, you see. At the time, there was this really division, you might say, of the house in Europe as to who is the right pope, who's going to come out on top. And this character, Giovanni de' Medici, had by this time, by 1410, developed a fair amount of capital. He had become a fairly wealthy man, and he had to make a choice, and he bet, and I'm not going to get the, the intricate details here, just kind of the, the big picture, he bet on Rome. He bet that the guy that was going to win this contest and become the a recognized pope would be the Roman pope, and so he sort of threw his support in for that pope, and that took place in 1410. The Pope at the time was John the 23rd, and John the 23rd was so appreciative of that support that he made Medici, uh, Giovanni de Medici, the official papal banker, you see, which was a huge coup for him and became a defining importance for the Medici family for the next several generations. So this alliance was formed at that point between the Medici family and Pope John the 23rd prior to the end of the papal schism. Well, when he died, which was in 1429, Giovanni was one of the richest men in Florence, one of the most famous and important men in all of Europe. He was succeeded by his son, Cosimo. Cosimo de' Medici is one of the more, would certainly be one of the uh, most important of the Medici characters. Also very good looking, you can see. He actually accompanied, when his father was still alive, uh, Cosimo, accompanied John the 23rd to the Council of Constance, which was convened in 1415. The Const Council of Constance expressed purpose 
was to resolve the problem of the papal schism. By now there were three popes, all claiming to be the true pope. And so the Council of Constance was organized to bring an end to this spectacle, which was causing so much ridicule for the leadership of the church. By the by, at the Council of Constance, John Huss was burned at the stake. That was almost like side business. It wasn't so important, although we're very interested in it. But anyway, Cosimo accompanies John the 23rd to the Council of Constance. Uh, he was, uh, during his lifetime, sort of the de facto ruler of Florence. A later pope, Pius II, said of Cosimo, political questions are settled in Cosimo's house. The man he cho chooses holds office. It is he who decides peace and war. He is king in all but name. For one year he was exiled because the Florentines were a little uncomfortable with anyone having that much power, but he was able to come back. And he was an extremely important political force, even though he never held a political office. He balanced power among Florence, Naples, Venice, Milan, other uh, Italian city-states, and so on. He was also able to prevent the French and also the Holy Roman Empire from invading. So the guy became just one of the most important personalities in Italy at this time, Cosimo de' Medici. You may know him best, however, for the uh, magnificent investment he made in art and really in many ways people would say the Italian Renaissance may have begun more with this man than anyone else. The most famous thing that was produced with his funding was the Duomo there in Florence. His patronage enabled the eccentric and bankrupt architect Brunelleschi to uh, complete the Duomo, uh, the, the uh, Dome of Santa Maria del Fiore, uh, which uh, is probably, was certainly his crowning achievement and certainly probably the most famous um, uh, symbol of the Renaissance in the city of Florence. Just while we're on the subject, look at the Duomo and notice the, the uh, top of that building. It's a dome, isn't it? And notice the difference between a dome and a spire. Earlier we looked at a cathedral where its architecture calls your eye up into the sky. You don't tend to look at the bottom of one of those structures, you look up. A dome has just the opposite effect. A dome, architecturally, is half a circle. A circle always tends to call your eye artistically to the center of the circle, not around the circle, but to the center. You see, that's the effect artistically of a circle as opposed to an arrow. An arrow tends to call your eye toward the direction the arrow's pointing. A dome tends to call your eye to the center of that half circle, which in this case would be the bottom of the dome, which means this world. And a dome architecturally thus stands for humanism. It stands for the fact that this world is more important, and it's no accident that in the Renaissance you don't see those huge spires, that Gothic kind of architecture anymore. Now you begin to see the dome being the dominant architectural motif, and this is probably one of the most famous illustrations of it. This man is called the father of the Italian Renaissance and uh, was probably one of the most important in giving a great push to it. His son, uh, Piero, didn't last very long. He was called Gouty because he was in such poor health and especially had a problem with gout. He did fan a certain degree of anti-Medici feeling in Florence. He survived, however, a couple of coups, a war with France. All of this took place, uh, or with Venice, all of this took place within about six years. He was able to keep the banking business running fairly smoothly. Uh, but he died as a fairly young man of gout and lung disease, and that brings then pr maybe the most famous Medici of all, uh, who is Lorenzo, sometimes called Lorenzo Magnifico, Mag Lorenzo the Magnificent, or Lorenzo the Great, uh, who is uh, maybe, you know, the most famous of the Medici family. Just two or three things without detailing his life uh, in any great detail. He has, there are two kids that he has, one his own son and one is adopted. The son of Lorenzo is Giovanni. This is Giovanni de' Medici who became the Pope Leo X who was the arch enemy of Martin Luther. And so when later we look at the life of Martin Luther and I mentioned to you Pope Leo X, this is the kid we're talking about, you see, grown up now and becoming uh, the Pope. He was of course a cardinal in the Catholic Church when he was still a teenager. So he was uh, on his way, he had a, a lot of upward uh, mobility there already. The, uh, the nephew of Lorenzo, 
the son of his deceased brother was named Julio. Julio, or Julius, uh, also became a pope. He was the pope that succeeded, came after Giovanni. And so you have two Medici popes right through the middle of the beginning of the Reformation. I'm, I'm emphasizing this because later we'll be coming back to this, and I'll just remind you that we talked about it at this juncture. Uh, because we want to look a little bit more at these guys' career later, not this morning, but uh, they will play rather prominently as we talk about the Reformation. So there's those two children, and then there's one further child that grows up in the same family who's more or less de facto adopted into the family. His name was Michelangelo. You've probably heard of him. Michelangelo, uh, of course, a genius of artistic ability, was recognized by Lorenzo even as a young man, as a teenager, and so these three grew up together. Uh, uh, Giovanni, uh, Giulio, and Michelangelo, uh, they grew up together in the same uh, sort of opulent surroundings of Lorenzo de' Medici, and this is part of what tied Michelangelo to the Medici family. And it put Michelangelo later in a very ticklish position, and we'll talk about this at a later time, because he, in a sense, had to turn his back on his Medici patrons uh, later during the time of the Florentine Republic when the Medici were driven out and that put uh, Michelangelo in a rather uh, difficult uh, position uh, throughout his career, but we'll save that for a little bit later. The other thing that's interesting about uh, Lorenzo is that at his death in 1492, he didn't want any priest of the Catholic Church, he didn't want any of the other officials of the Catholic Church to come and hear his final prayer of confession, he wanted Savranola. Savranola, who was a bit of a firebrand and is already co quite controversial, was nevertheless highly respected. And Lorenzo felt that if anybody, you know, should hear his confession of sins and hopefully uh, bring him some uh, sense of salving his conscience, it would be this character. So Savranola already is playing a role there. The last guy we'll mention this morning is uh, Piero. Uh, he was nicknamed the unfortunate. Uh, he was not uh, anywhere near the competence of his forebears. He was weak. He was a poor manager. He only survived for two years, and then he was driven out. And the Medici family, you see, was driven out of Florence for the better part of 20 years. And this gave rise to one of the most interesting experiments during the Renaissance called the Republic of Florence. And the Republic of Florence was guided by two great minds. One of them was uh, Savonarola, and the other one was kind of the right-hand man to Savonarola, who gave him great assistance in his political uh, uh, strategies, was a guy by the name of, anyone would guess? Machiavelli. Huh? So Machiavelli and Savonarola form an unlikely pair, the dynamic duo here, and they govern essentially uh, Florence now for about 20 years while the Medici are in exile. They've been driven out by the Florentines, and this is of course during the time that Michelangelo sculpted the David, which became the great symbol of Florentine independence, you may know. That's what got him in some degree of trouble with the Medici later, even though they did like that sculpture. Uh, but uh, the symbolism of it was somewhat uh, troubling to them. So anyway, this is what's happening. Uh, the Republic of Florence is established under Savonarola's influence, and this is really his kind of claim to fame, as he was the dominant character in Florence for about 10 years during the last decade of the 15th century, and so let's turn our attention then to Eurolamo Savonarola. You know, with a face like that, you would repent, wouldn't you? I mean, look at this guy. He looks like he could preach from the book of Revelation, doesn't he? I'm sorry, Eurolamo, I love you. You're a great guy, but, you know, it's equal opportunity here. As one ugly guy to another, you know, we can... Uh, Anyway, let's look at his life uh, briefly in the limited time we have. He starts off, he was born in 1452, right in the middle of the 15th century. He was trained in these newly recovered Greek documents. He was definitely infused with what was called the new learning, you know, this kind of flood of new insight. The sources that were coming in from the East were all available to him in his educational process, and I think that certainly had something to do with 
with his, uh, his own view of things. He was very critical of the corruption of the church leaders, even as a young man. And he didn't mince any words in calling attention to what he saw as the, uh, the precipitous decline of the moral authority of the leadership in the church. There were two early works of his, both of which were very poignant in developing that theme. One was called On the Ruin of the World, published in 1472, and the second one, On the Ruin of the Church, published in 1475. So he, puts, he, he plants his stakes rather early, and there's not really any big question as to where he was going to be coming from. He became a Dominican friar in the year 1475, and throughout his career, he was indeed a monk, a Dominican. As a, uh, as a Dominican, he continued his studies. He got uh, probably as many advanced degrees as were available in the educational paradigm of the day. He was also critical of his own order of monks. He felt that the Dominicans had fallen into great kind of uh, luxuriousness and laxity and lack of discipline and so on. So he's, he's, a, he's kind of a firebrand all the way around. You know, he doesn't have uh, much uh, tolerance for what he sees as the great uh, declining state of the church, more or less in all quarters that he was familiar with. In 1482, he was assigned to St. Mark's in Florence. There's a St. Mark's in Venice, not the same place, but this is St. Mark's in Florence. And uh, he took up preaching there, but he was not popular. He was too strident, too harsh, and this was the time when people were just kind of digging the Renaissance and good things were happening, and this guy just seemed way out of sync, you know, with what was going on. So even though he was preaching powerfully, he wasn't winning much of a following, and he himself felt that his own ministry was, a, was an abysmal failure. He, he had a great deal of self-doubt during these years as he would prepare and preach probably magnificently and you know half a dozen people would show up to hear his sermons. It was during this time, however, that he uh, received what he called the San Giorgio Revelations, which he set forth as seven reasons that judgment must come on Europe, on the church, on Florence, on all of these places, judgment must come. And so this was kind of a supernatural, you'd say, uh, discovery he made based on these uh, visions that he had, the, the uh, revelations. The next uh, chapter of his life, he becomes an itinerant preacher. He leaves Florence and goes to the north of Italy. And this is where he really began to get some traction. He was again preaching the same message, repentance, discipline, but outside of the culture of Florence, people were much more receptive to this message, and large crowds began to come and hear him preach. It was kind of like Billy Graham coming to tra town, you know, in that setting. Uh, people would come, they would come forward, they would repent, there would be weeping, there would be all kinds of indicia of a kind of impact of the preaching of God's Word, and, and this is really where Savernola became kind of a famous character. It was during this time that his own confidence began to uh, increase. He began to believe that God really had called him to the kind of ministry that he was engaging in, and he certainly became a much more famous character during this time. I mentioned Pico earlier. Uh, Pico was a very close associate of Lorenzo, and Pico, who was also, I believe, a deep Christian, but a humanist and a Renaissance character, believed that Florence needed Savonarola back, that the developing uh, sort of forces in the city made it clear that somebody with a great kind of powerful voice to correct what seemed to be an increasing kind of lasciviousness in the city was essential. And so Pico put a lot of pressure on Lorenzo, and Lorenzo indeed acceded to that, and Savonarola was invited to come back, and now I'm calling this the era of him being the prophet. So Savonarola arrives back in, in Florence in uh, 1490. This is when he preached his uh, extensive series of sermons on the book of Revelation. He went through the book of Revelation and virtually every chapter, every verse, he was applying to the conditions of the church at that time. And he saw in all of those symbols and all of those graphic kinds of descriptions of judgments and wickedness and harlotry and all of those kinds of things that are so uh, dramatic in the book of Revelation, these colorful, powerful images, he saw all of that as what was unfolding before his eyes and he preached it with no apology. 
So it was quite a powerful and controversial ministry that he took up arriving back in Florence. He condemned the rich clergy, he condemned the papal corruption, he condemned everything. It was equal opportunity across the board. Nobody was spared the uh, sharp, biting critique of uh, Savonarola. Uh, Lorenzo, you would have thought, would have been put off by this guy and would have tried to figure, because you know, Lorenzo himself, by the way, was the target of a fair amount of this, this kind of uh, uh, criticism. But uh, interestingly, Lorenzo had such respect for him that as I mentioned to you earlier, when Lorenzo was on his deathbed and he knew he was dying, he didn't want anyone except uh, Eurolamo Savarinola to be there hearing his final confession and to pronounce te absolvo, I forgive you, to give that final kind of last rite there uh, to ease his conscience. And so that was the kind of credibility that the man had developed by that time. He predicted, interestingly, uh, in his career, the coming of a new Cyrus. You know, in the Old Testament, Cyrus the Great delivers the Jewish people from Babylonian captivity and frees them to go back to Jerusalem. Savarinola predicted that a new Cyrus was going to come into the affairs of the church and into Italy during his lifetime. And interestingly, what happened was that Charles VIII, the French king, the successor after the Hundred Years' War, who was now consolidating French power and attempting to expand French holdings, indeed invaded Italy. And Savonarola said, this is him. This is the new Cyrus. You know, I don't know if he was right or not, but he did successfully negotiate with Charles to keep uh, Florence from being put under siege and being put under the horrific conditions that might otherwise have befallen it based on this invading army. And so whether this was the good new Cyrus or not, Savarinola just was catapulted into the status of political genius because he had been able to exempt Florence now from what was a ravaging kind of effect of this French occupation that was uh, going on in the rest of Italy. So he negotiated with Charles uh, to spare. He made a remarkable prediction to the Florentines at this time. He said, quote, I announce this good news to the city, that Florence will be more glorious, richer, more powerful than she's ever been. First, glorious in the sight of God as well as of men, and you, O Florence, will be the reformation of all Italy. And from here, the renewal will begin and spread everywhere, because this is the navel of Italy. Your counsels will return all by the light and grace that God will give you. Second, O Florence, you will have innumerable riches, and God will multiply all things for you. Third, you will spread your empire, and thus you will have power, temporal and spiritual. This is in the context of saying to them, as you repent and pursue a godly life, God is going to pour all of these blessings out upon you. It didn't actually quite happen that way, but it certainly had a powerful effect on them at the time. When the Medici were driven out, partly because of Savonarola's own influence, as I say, Florence attempted a grand experiment in Republican government. Machiavelli was his right-hand man. Machiavelli is most famous, of course, for The Prince, which is a treatise on power politics, but he himself, Niccolo Machiavelli, always preferred Republican government and freely admitted it. He wrote The Prince more or less as a practical necessity, not because he personally endorsed that as the best of all possible forms of government. And so he was very much at the right hand of uh, Savonarola as the two of them tried to orchestrate then Republican governance there, and they oversaw uh, extensive legislation for public morality and modesty. Uh, he continued to give these remarkable promises and prophecies of glory that would come to Florence. He was modestly supported for a time by the Pope until they had a falling out over this French invasion and then the Pope, who was Alexander VI at that time, because he differed with Savonarola, prevent or, or uh, prohibited him from preaching. So the papal action against Savonarola, I'm, I'm skipping past the details here just to give you the kind of the big picture, but Savonarola continued to preach, you see, in spite of this papal uh, prohibition. Uh, he didn't stop, he didn't back down. And as a result of that, he was excommunicated and there was a threatened interdict against the city, which would make the sacraments in the city invalid and 
scared all the people so that they turned against Savonarola. He was tried uh, in a kind of trial by ordeal that ended somewhat ambiguously, but the final result of it was that in 14. 98, he was executed with two of his assistants, and so this remarkable character who had had such a powerful impact in, uh, in Florence nevertheless uh, ended uh, a, mar a martyr's death uh, at that point. Savernola continued to have a deep influence, though, because even though he was uh, executed, the policies that he put in place did continue somewhat importantly in the city for some time to come. Machiavelli was very much a part of that. Luther and the other reformers praised Savonarola as a forerunner of the Reformation. Machiavelli said this of him. This is from the prince. If Moses, Cyrus, Theseus, and Romulus had been unarmed, they could not have enforced their constitutions for long as happened in our time to Brother Yerlamo Savonarola, who was ruined with his new order of things immediately the multitude believed in him no longer, and he had no means of keeping steadfast those who believed or of making the unbelievers to believe. He wrote that in the Prince, and the context was that you can be a great moral reformer, but you still have to have a sword at your side to make it stick. And as soon as public opinion turns against you, if you don't have the sword to back up your moral pronouncements, then you're going to lose as Savonarola did. That was Machiavelli's assessment. I have a different assessment, uh, and it's going to be my very brief, uh, somewhat abbreviated Sunday school lesson this morning at long last. Uh, and it comes from Revelation once again. This is chapter 19. Chapter 18, I quoted to you a moment ago, and chapter 19, contains these words. John says, I saw heaven opened, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that only he himself knows. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp, double-edged sword. He will strike the nations with a rod of iron. He tramples the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, that if a person is wielding the weapons of Christ himself, the sword that comes out of his mouth, which is, my friends, his word, that there is no force ultimately that can resist it. It is a force more potent than bazookas or bombs or any other of the earthly armaments that we like to think become displays of power. Christ rules through his word. And whether we live or die, whether we with Savonarola have a martyr's death or like John Calvin lives out his days, either way, the test of Christ's rule always comes back to the power of his word. And so I think uh, even though Machiavelli didn't see it that way, that from a biblical point of view, we must see it that way. And that's why we as God's people never need to be or should be or could be embarrassed to proclaim the word of God into a corrupt culture such as the one in which we live.